Now, because the Bible does not specifically tell us how the Holy Spirit indwells us, whatever view you hold, whether it's literal or, literal or representative, we are not to hold this view, either view, as a fellowship issue. Believe what you want to believe, but make sure it's according to your own study. The only time it becomes a fellowship issue is when a person takes the Holy Spirit and has him working outside of the Word. You see, God has chosen to, to place the power of salvation and the guidance through life in his Holy Word in the Bible. Paul made a serious proclamation in Romans 1 verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. Peter said now in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. James, he says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. James chapter 1 verse 21. For the Holy Spirit to work outside of this powerful word is to contradict the very teaching of the Holy Spirit himself. And when you get to that point, then you can make anything go. Whatever you want to believe, you can claim the Holy Spirit has told you. So let's begin looking at the literal view of the indwelling. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make it known up front that this is not the view I hold to. And the reason I'm saying that is I'm not trying to, try to degrade anybody that holds a view different than I am. I'm not trying to influence you to believe the way I believe. I'm just trying to say that I hope that I can do this in a fair fashion. Now, to prove that the Holy Spirit dwells in us literally, several verses are used by some of our brethren. And one of those is Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It's used to show that the Holy Spirit is given to one who repents and is baptized for the remission of their sins. There it says, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there are two ways to interpret this phrase, gift of the Holy Spirit. You can interpret it to mean that the Holy Spirit is given as a gift, or that the Holy Spirit gives a gift. Depending upon your view of the indwelling really determines the interpretation that you use. Now, to determine the view that we uphold, we're going to have to go to more than just Acts chapter 2. We're going to have to go to other verses throughout the scriptures. In Galatians 3, 14, Jesus is said to have died that the Gentiles might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, it's contended that the Holy Spirit was given as a promise and he is received through faith. This would parallel Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where the Holy Spirit was given upon the Jews to their obedience to the faith on the day of Pentecost. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, we read that God gave, the earnest unto, uh, gave unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And also in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, is contended that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our salvation. And therefore, it's concluded that when God gave the earnest of the Spirit, he literally gave the Spirit as the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. Now, to show that the gift and the promise and the earnest is actually the Holy Spirit himself, other verses are used that use the same grammatical form. For example, in Hebrews 9, verse 15, we're told that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal salvation. Certainly, the writer did not mean that eternal salvation promised us something, but that we were promised eternal salvation. In Revelation 14, 11, certain ones received the mark of his name. The mark was not given by the name, but the name was actually the mark that was given. And therefore, because of the same grammatical use, or the same construction, some conclude that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, as in Acts chapter 2, meaning that we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. There's another argument for the literal indwelling, and it concerns receiving the word. 
Those who believe in the representative indwelling, they believe the Holy Spirit dwells in us as we receive and are influenced by the Word of God. But the argument is that we receive the Word of God before we are ever baptized and become the children of God. The claim is we then receive the Holy Spirit before we ever become Christians, if the Holy Spirit indwells through the Word. Here's what they say concerning Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38. It gives the order here. You receive the word, you believe, you repent, you're baptized for the remission of sins, and you receive the Holy Spirit. Also in Acts 2, 41, it says, Then they that received the word were baptized. Receiving the word came before baptism and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So they claim this has alien sinners receiving the Spirit. They have another argument in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. that says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. The argument is this. If someone dwells within a house, they don't do so in a representative fashion, but they do so literally. So it must be true of the Holy Spirit that he literally dwells within our body. The human body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. Now, I'm sure there's other verses that can be used concerning the literal indwelling, but hopefully these will encourage you to study further on the issue. The second view of the indwelling of the Spirit is called the representative indwelling. In essence, it says that the Holy Spirit in, indwells us as we are influenced and motivated by the teaching of Jesus Christ that was revealed by the Holy Spirit. It says that the Holy Spirit does not actually and literally dwell within our bodies. To understand this view, it's imperative that we understand what the Bible says concerning the Holy Spirit's communication and how he communicates. Now, the Holy Spirit communicates with us the only way that communication that can ever be affected, and that is by means of signs of ideas or words. There are only five ways that impressions can be made upon the human mind, and that is the five senses that we have. Taste, touch, see, feel, and hearing. Now, it's impossible to smell the truth. It's impossible to feel the truth. It's impossible to taste the truth. The only way we can observe truth and understand truth is by the hearing of the ears and the seeing of the eyes. So this is the only way that intelligible communication can ever be accomplished. The scriptures affirm that this is the manner in which the Holy Spirit communicates to us. It is through words. Listen to the words of David in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. He says, The Lord, or the Spirit of the Lord, spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Spirit communicated through David by speaking. And that speaking was effected by words. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. The Spirit informed of some impending apostasy. And how did he do that? He did it through speaking. What was the means that he accomplished this speaking? It was through the use of words. How did he communicate these words to Paul? He did it expressly. In other words, clearly and plainly. I think an appreciation of this obvious biblical fact is essential to our understanding the teaching of the scriptures regarding the mode and the manner in which the Holy Spirit influences human beings today. I want to read something that Brother Guy Wood said. He said, if people can be brought to see that the only way in which the Holy Spirit ever did influence is through intelligible communication involving the use of words, no longer will the denominational concept that the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs through one's hunches, one's intimations, one's so-called inner leadings be acceptable. How does the Holy Spirit communicate to us? Through words. As Jesus said in Revelation 2 verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now, where do we find this Spirit's communication? 
We all know the answer to that. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture originated with God. This scripture is conveyed by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is God to mankind. And these scriptures are fully effective for the purpose that was intended. They are profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto all good works. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter said, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. This knowledge is through words. That's the Spirit's communication. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is provided through the scriptures, the words of the Spirit. If the Spirit or the scriptures provide everything in life, then there's no need of this direct influence of the Spirit upon our lives. The Spirit only influences and motivates by means of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And in every instance in which it says that the Spirit motivates us, the Word of God does the exact same thing. I want you again to listen to what Brother Wood said. Every influence wrought directly upon us, every fruit which the Holy Spirit lavishly bestows, Every spiritual need from the moment of the gospel is heard until we die comes through faithful obedience to the word which the Spirit gave, not through an operation apart from and independent of it. <clears throat> now, to understand more about the mode of the indwelling of the Spirit, I think there's some questions we kind of need to ask ourselves and get some answers to. And here are some of the questions. What more can an, a direct indwelling of the Holy Spirit do than what the representative indwelling actually does? And the answer is absolutely nothing. There's no difference between the two. But that's the problem. Some people cannot leave it right there and they've got to have the Holy Spirit doing something to them. In my first work uh, was up in New Hampshire and it was a hard work. One of the elders there believed in the direct indwelling, but he also believed in the Spirit working apart from the Word. He's heavily influenced by Mac Deaver. So we instantly clashed over the Holy Spirit issue. And he just told me one day, he says, I believe the Holy Spirit works. And my reply was, I do too, but it's through the Word. And he said, no, I know he's in me. And if he's in me, he's got to be doing something. And it's separate and apart from the Word. The literal view oftentimes leads to someone believing that the Holy Spirit, if they're in you, has to be doing something separate and apart from the Word. Now, if you believe in the direct indwelling, that's great. It's fine. But just don't make sure that you don't take that next step. What about the deity literally and actually inhabiting human flesh? Jesus Christ was the incarnate Word. He was deity inhabiting human flesh. Because he was deity, it was proper and right for people to offer worship to him, wasn't it? If we have deity literally within us, then why is not the Holy Spirit, who is God and apparently uh, indwelling human flesh, worthy of such worship? Would it be okay for someone and would it be proper for someone to bow down and worship someone who's a Christian because the Holy Spirit is literally within them? What about the indwelling of God the Father and Christ the Son? The scriptures plainly teach that both of them also dwell in us. 1 John 4.15 says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. In Ephesians 3.17, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I don't know of anyone who claims that God and Christ literally dwell in us, but they claim that they do so in a representative fashion through the word, through faith. 
And it's a strange form of exegesis to say that those two indwell us in a representative fashion, but the Holy Spirit, who is also God, dwells within us in a direct fashion. We're plainly told how Christ indwells us. It's by faith. Faith comes by hearing God's word. And it would only seem right that the other two members of the Godhead would indwell us in the very same manner. So what about the Holy Spirit being given as a gift, a promise, and an earnest? Those who believe in the representative indwelling of the Holy Spirit do not believe that the gift of the Holy Spirit was a, the gift of the Spirit being given, but it was a gift that was given by the Spirit. And that would be eternal life. The representative view contends that the Spirit is not, the Spirit is not given literally to us. He does not literally indwell us. And the reason we do that is because if you have your Bibles, let's go to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter 8. And here we have the Samaritans. And Philip is preaching to the Samaritans. They had believed, they had been baptized, and yet they hadn't received the Spirit at all. And look at verses 15 and 16 of Acts chapter 8. Peter and John have now showed up, the apostles. It says, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, if Peter promised that we receive the Holy Spirit literally when we are converted, according to Acts 2.38, the question would be, why had these Samaritans who had been baptized in the name of Jesus why had they not received the Spirit? The conclusion is that Peter never promised the Spirit upon our conversion, but he promised a gift that was given by the Spirit, which would be eternal life. And the promise of the Spirit in Galatians 3, verse 14, is actually referring to salvation that is in Jesus Christ through faith. Isaiah 32, verse 15, and Isaiah 44, 3 mention the pouring out of the Spirit in the context of salvation. <clears throat> the earnest of the Spirit that we read of in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5, would be not be the down payment, but it would be a pledge that was given by the Spirit. That pledge by the Spirit would be the gospel of Jesus Christ, giving us the confidence that we have in Christ. And therefore, that's why Paul could say, we walk not by faith, or not by sight, but by faith, uh, verse 7. Now, here's another question. If the Holy Spirit dwells within us representatively through the word, then what about the person who has heard the gospel, but has never obeyed? Now, the Spirit only dwells within a person as they're influenced and motivated by the Word of God. This is what the representative view holds. One who is not a son is not a Christian, and therefore they're not motivated by the Spirit of sonship. The Spirit leads a sinner to comply to the conditions that's applicable to a sinner but he encourages and he motivates the Christian to comply to the conditions of a son. And that's the difference. First John 4, verse 6, John said, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He that is not of God would be a non-Christian, and he has never been motivated, never been influenced by the word of God. He may have heard it but he wasn't influenced by it. And John says, he heareth not us, and therefore they don't know the spirit of truth. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. Take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> I have one more question. Does not the Bible teach that the body of the Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, I want you to listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. And if you're a person who likes to underline in your Bible, I do. Uh, you might want to underline some things here. But let's go ahead and read these two verses to start with. 1 Corinthians ch chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. He says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, 
which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, there are nine pronouns in these two short verses. Pronouns ye, your, and you. And in the original language, all of these pronouns are in the plural sense. And they modify two nouns, body and temple. And you'll notice both of them are singular. Now, I don't know how much you know about grammar, but that's not good grammar. If you have plural pronouns, they're to modify a plural noun. If you have singular nouns, they're to modify a singular noun. But here we have plural pronouns modifying singular nouns. Now, before you start making a judgment on God, the Holy Spirit is a first-degree grammarian, grammarian. He has not made a mistake here. The singular body, which is spoken of in a plural sense, is not the individual Christian's body. He's talking about the church here. As Paul said in Romans 12, verse 4, for we have many members in one body. The temple of the Holy Spirit in which he dwells is not the individual's member's body. Rather, it is the body of Christ, the church. That's the temple that we are not to defile, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. So it really doesn't matter what two views you hold, which one of these two. We are not to draw lines of fellowship over this. I have some really good friends, preacher friends, that hold to the other view. And that's fine. It is not a fellowship issue. The fact of the matter is, God has not specifically told us how the Holy Spirit indwells us. That has to be something that you decide according to your own study. So don't believe something because maybe I teach it or because some other man teaches it. You need to believe this according to your own study. The Holy Spirit does indwell Christians along with God in Christ. But we are only led by the Spirit when we are led by his word, which is his sword. Hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Listen to what your Bible teaches you. And make your own decision on how you want to believe on this. Now, we are to listen to the scriptures very carefully, especially when it comes to our salvation. And the scriptures plainly tell us that we have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess Jesus before man. And we have to be baptized into Christ. The only way to get into Christ. And that's where all spiritual blessings are found, including salvation. And then we have to live faithfully from there on. And if there's someone here who needs to make a change in their life, whatever it may be, if you've never obeyed the gospel, the water is ready in the baptistry. We can immerse you into Christ this night if you so desire. If you need further study, we would be glad to set up a Bible study with you to see things a little bit clearer. If you are a child of God and you strayed away from your pathway of duty, then please come back to where you ought to be. If there's anything that we can help you with this night, won't you come while together we stand and sing.